All right, uh, I'm going to go through the uh, exam one review problems that are on Moodle. All right, so the first question is your HCN plus your 2H2O goes to uh, NH4HCO2. Uh, the rate is given. It was determined experimentally. Uh, it is uh, K times the concentration of HCN. Uh, the rate constant K uh, is also given, 8.06 times 10 to the minus 6, 1 over second. And so part A says to calculate the half-life. So the first thing that you need to recognize is they gave you the experimental rate law. And there is a 1 here. It's not put. It's understood. All right. And so that tells us this was experimentally determined that this is a first order rate law. You could also get that by the units of K. One over seconds are the units for a first order rate law. And so you have to use the equation for half-life for first order. And so that is 0.693 divided by K. So this is a very simple question if you recognize the first order and know the first order half-life equation to use. And so your half-life is 0.693 divided by 8.06 times 10 to the minus 6, 1 over seconds. You push the buttons on your calculator uh, and you get 85,980. All right, so I like to put it in a time that I can understand better. And so there are 60 seconds in a minute and there are 60 minutes in an hour and so when you push the buttons you can give your answer if it doesn't say give it in seconds minutes or hours give it in any time you want uh, i always will give it in a time i can understand and so that is 23.9 hours approximately one day so that is your half-life for that reaction so in part B, it says, how long is it going to take to reduce the initial concentration of HCN to 6.25% of its initial? All right, so that I know is a half-life number. And so I will write that I'm going to start with 100%. And when I go down to 50%, I know that takes 23.9 hours. I just calculate I calculated the half-life from part A. All right. I also know it's first order and that never changes. So when I go from 50% down to 25%, another half-life, that is 23.9 hours as well. And when I go from 25 to 12.5%, that is another 23.9 hours. And then finally, when I go down to my 6.25%, which is the problem, uh, it's what it's asking, that's another 23.9 hours. So you simply add 23.9 hours four times to get your answer, uh, and that is 95.6 hours. So your answer to part B is 95.6 hours. There is another way you could solve that, uh, but that is the way that I would do it if it is a half-life. So you could have solved it the same way we're going to have to solve part C, which is how long is it going to take to reduce the concentration of uh, HCN to 10% of its initial, All right? And so you have your concentration of HCN uh, initial, and then you're going to have it at time T. Well, at time T, it's going to be 10% of the initial. So we convert our percent into decimals. So it is a 0 0.100 times your HCN initial. So whatever your concentration of HCN initial is, the concentration at this time, how long is it going to take to reduce it to? It's only going to be 10% of the initial. So you take 10% of your initial, and that's going to be your concentration of HCN at time t. Again, we're doing a first order, so you have to know the first order equation. All right, so there are a few of them. The one that I'm going to use is the ln, natural log, of your concentration of A at time T over the concentration of A initial. And that is equal to negative 
K T. All right, and so we just plug in what we have here. So we have the LN, the concentration of HCN at time T is 0.1 times the concentration of HCN initial divided by the concentration of HCN initial. And so we see that our concentration of HCN initials will cancel. And that is equal to negative K. K was given in the problem. All right, so K um, in the problem was given as a 8.06 times 10 to the minus 6, 1 over seconds. And that is then uh, the variable that we need to solve for is the T. All right, so this comes out to be the ln of 0.1. All right, and then we're going to divide both sides by the negative. So when you divide both sides by the negative 8.06 times 10 to the minus 6, when you divide both sides by negative 8.06 times 10 to the minus 6, push the buttons on your calculator, and you get your time, and this is in seconds because this is in 1 over seconds. Dividing by 1 over seconds will give you seconds. So uh, you got 28,568 seconds. And I converted the last one into hours. I will convert this one into hours. So I know there are 3,600 seconds in an hour. All right, and so that comes out to be 79.4 hours, which is our answer to part C. Now, if we go up, we could get an estimation of this answer. So an estimation of this answer is right in here somewhere. All right, so the 10% is in here. All right, and so when you calculate how long it takes to get down to 12.5%, right, and so that is your uh, 23.9 times 3, that is 71.7 hours. So to go from here to here, 71.7 hours, all right, we calculated how long it took to go down to here. That was in part B. That was the 95.6 hours. And so the answer has to be between here. So it's going to be more than 71.7. It's got to be less than 95.6. And so now we know we have the correct answer. It is a 79.4 hours. Uh, greater than the 71.7, but less than the 95.6. All right, part two here. In part problem two, all right, we have another reaction. We have our uh, 203s going to 302s. The K value is given. Uh, it is 1.4 times 10 to the minus second, 1 over molarity time seconds. And our concentration initial for the ozone, O3, is 6 times 10 to the minus 3. Write the rate law. Okay, so last time they gave us uh, the rate law, this time... They're going to have us write the rate law. When you're going to write the rate law, we only have one reactant. And so we know that the rate is going to equal K times the concentration of O3. And then it's going to be raised to the X. That has to be found experimentally. Well, we know that this tells us the answer. And then the units for K being 1 over molarity times seconds, this tells us this is a second order reaction. And so K had to be determined experimentally. And so the uh, rate law then is determined experimentally to be a second order rate law. And so it is the O3 raised to the second power. So that is your rate law. All right. So now we know that this is a second order. So the first question was first order. The second question is second order. And so the second order half-life equation, you're going to have an equation sheet. You have to know which one is for first order, which one is for second order. It is 1 over the concentration of A initial times K. All right. And so to find your half-life, which is part B, you simply take 
your numbers they give you. So your half-life is 1 over the initial concentration. The initial concentration is 6 times 10 to the minus 3. And that is your 1, uh, that's your molarity, that's your initial concentration. And then your K, also given as 1.40 times 10 to the minus 2, 1 over molarity times seconds. And so the molarities will cancel, and you again have 1 over, 1 over seconds for your units. And so when you push the buttons on your calculator, you get your answer in seconds, and that is 11,000. 904 seconds. Again, I'm going to go to hours. And so I'm going to divide by the 3,600 seconds in an hour. And that gives me 3.31 hours. All right. And so that is your half-life for this second order reaction. All right. So now is where we get into understanding the question. So in part C is how long for 75% of the O3 to decompose. All right, so if 73% of it has decomposed, that means that 25% remains. All right, so you have to read the question very carefully. All right, so this is, again, a half-life. It's a perfect uh, half-life because the first half-life goes from 100% down to 50%. The second half-life goes from 50% down to 25%. All right. And so when 75% has decomposed, here's 50% that decomposed. Here's another 50% that decomposes. All right. And so at that point, you see that 75% decomposed 25% still remains. All right, so this was calculated uh, above. This was the 3.31 hours. All right, so if we calculate uh, the half-life here, remember, first order never changes. This is not first order. This is second order. And so your half-life depends on your initial concentration. And so your half-life for the second one is one half for your initial concentration. So whatever you started with your initial concentration here, it is one half of that here, which then doubles your time every single time. So with the first order, it would be the same time every single time you do a first order. Second order, it doubles every time. 6.62 hours is how long it would take to go from 50% down to 25. It doubles every time. If you're going down to your 12.5%, that's going to be 13.24 hours. All right. So, but the question was just go down to 25% remaining. And so you simply add those two up and you get your 9.93 hours. All right. And so it will take 9.93 hours for 75% of that to decompose or for 25% of that to remain. All right. And so here it says how long for 90% of the O3 to decompose. All right. So that means that 10% remains. All right. And so now we have our O3 initial concentration. We have that number, it's given. And that is 6 times 10 to the minus 3. And now we're going to have the uh, concentration of ozone at time t. At this time, we know that only 10% remains. So only 10% of the original 6.00 times 10 to the minus 3 molar remains. All right, and so then again, this is second order, so we have to know our second order uh, integrated rate law. And so that is 1 over A at time T minus 1 over A initial is equal to KT. There's a bunch of different uh, ways you can rearrange that mathematically. Uh, here is the one that, that I'm going to use. All right, so then we just plug in the numbers. We have everything except for 
uh, time. And so 1 over a at time t, so if we multiply that out, that's 6 times 10 to the minus 4 minus 1 over your initial concentration, 6 times 10 to the minus 3. All right, so that's on the left side. That's equal to k, which is given. k was given 1.40 times 10 to the minus 2. one over molarity times seconds. All right, and so then we have to solve for time. Of course, these units are molarity. All right, and so your molarities are going to cancel when you divide both sides by 1.40 times 10 to the minus two, and then you get your answer for T. All right, and so T in seconds is uh, 107,143. All right, I'm leaving all the sig figs in. I will convert it to three sig figs after I get it in hours. So dividing by 3,600 seconds in an hour, you get the time for that to decompose to only 10% that remains, 90% reacted, is 29.8 hours. All right, and so when we uh, go back up and look. So again, we could get uh, an estimation. All right, so again, this would be times two. Each time we go up, it's times two. So we multiplied by two. The second half-life is there, times two. You got a four, you got a two, you got a 13.24 hours. And then when you go down to the 6.25, it's another times 2. So that is a 26.48 hours. All right, so we know that we're right in this area for the 10% remains. All right, and so when you add your 13.24 to this, 7, 1, all right. So you, you're looking at 23.17 hours. So it has to be more than 27, 23.17 hours. That would be down to your 12.5%. And then the 6.25% would then, you would have to add the 26.48. So that's a five, a six, a nine. All right. So you have to have your number must be between 23 and 49 hours. So you look at your answer and it is 29.8 hours, which is between 23 and 49. All right, so that's just, you don't have to do that, but that is confirming that you have the correct answer. All right, so make sure you can do first order, second order integrated rate laws. Uh, definitely will be on the test. All right, in three, so number three, was a lab question, so we just did this in lab. All right, so we increased our temperature by 10 degrees. All right, so we went, let's say we started at 20 and went to 30. And then the reaction should have went twice as fast. So if the 20 degrees Celsius one took four minutes, then the 30 degrees should have only taken two minutes. All right, so it should have been twice as fast when you have the 10 degrees higher, which is the rule of thumb. All right, so to calculate the energy of activation, you take your ln of K2 divided by K1 is equal to your energy of activation over R times 1 over T1 minus 1 over T2. And that equation will be listed on the equation sheet. All right, so we have T1. T1 is 20 degrees Celsius. You must immediately convert that to Kelvin. 273.15. So you have uh, 293.2 Kelvin given to the correct number of sig figs, one decimal, one decimal, and one decimal. All right, and then K1 is simply going to be called K1. We don't have a number for K1, so we're just going to call it K1. All right, so then we have T2. T2 is 30 degrees Celsius. 
plus 273.15. So now we're at 303.2 Kelvin. And what do we know about K2? Well, we know that it is two times faster than the first reaction. So it's going to be two times your K1. And so when we plug in our numbers, now when we plug them in up here, we have the ln K2 is equal to 2K1. Divided by K1, you see that the K1s are going to cancel. You're just going to have the ln of 2. Energy of activation, that is what we're looking for. The units of energy of activation are going to be in joules per mole, which tells us we must use the 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. 1 over the T1, which was 293.2. Minus 1 over the T2, 303.2. Again, these must be in Kelvin. And so those, when you subtract, you're going to have 1 over Kelvin. It's going to subtract the 1 over 1 over Kelvin. That's gone. All right, so then we're going to multiply both sides by the 8.314 to get the answer to the correct units in joules per mole. All right, and so when you push the buttons on your calculator correctly, you get an energy of activation to be 5.12 times 10 to the fourth joules per mole. All right, so that is the correct answer, unless it says give the energy of activation in kilojoules per mole. Many times it's given in kilojoules per mole, so that is also the same as 51.2 kilojoules. So the units that you're going to get, joules per mole, if the answer wants you to have that in kilojoules per mole, you will have to divide by a thousand. If it doesn't ask, then either answer is full credit. If it doesn't say which units you have to be in. All right. Problem number four. All right, we're given a reaction. 2HI goes to H2 plus I2, and the delta H is given. It is 60 kilojoules per mole, and energy of activation is given 183 kilojoules per mole. Sketch your, the potential energy reaction profile. All right, so you don't have to draw it to scale, but you do have to see that you have an endothermic reaction. All right, and so when you draw your potential energy diagram, you have your potential energy, you've got your progress of reaction. You're going to start with your reactants. You are going to go up to your transition state. Then you're going to come down and you're going to get your products. So here are your reactants. Here is your products. Here is your transition state, which has your activated complex. All right, so you have to be able to label all the parts of your graph. So you have to know back in um, chapter six that we did delta H. Delta H is products minus reactants. So delta H is your delta H products minus delta H reactants. All right, so your delta H is right there. And we were given a number for that. That was 60 kilojoules. Energy of activation goes from reactants to your transition state. All right, so we know that this is the energy of activation, and that number was given as well, 183 kilojoules. All right, so there is your um, reaction profile. You show your endothermic. You label your energy of activation. You label your delta H. All right, so that is all you need for part A. Now, part B. Calculate the energy of activation and delta H for the reverse reaction. Well, delta H for reverse 
is simple. When we did S's law, we knew when you reverse a reaction, you just change the sign of your delta H. So if delta H is very simple, it is minus 60 kilojoules per mole. And now you have to look at the graph. So the energy of activation for the reverse, when you're doing the reverse direction, this is your energy of activation for the reverse. All right, so the reverse is your products going to the transition state. All right, and so in this case, you see that it's smaller. It is smaller by this amount that we know we would labeled as the delta H. All right, so we know that this amount is 60, and we know that the amount from reactants to the transition state is 183. And so a simple subtraction gets us our answer. So the energy of activation is simply the 183 kilojoules minus the 60 kilojoules to give us our 123 kilojoules. So your energy of activation is 123 kilojoules. Now, energy of activation is always a positive number. All right, so that is your energy of activation, and of course your delta H when you reverse a reaction, you just change the sign. Any endothermic reaction will become an exothermic reaction. Okay, number five, determine the rate law given the following reaction mechanism. All right, so we're doing a mechanism. So the first question is to label the rate determining step. That is very simple. That is simply the slow step. All right, and so when you're given a reaction mechanism, it will be labeled for you as the slow step. And so label the rate determining step. It's right here, rate determining step. So that's simply step two, the one that was labeled as slow. So that is where we're going to write our rate law. All right, but first we're going to give the overall reaction. So part B says give the overall reaction. So we're just going to add these reactions up. All right, when we add them up, we see that one Ti plus two cancels with one Ti plus two. And that's it. We just bring it down after that. Overall reaction is simply a Ti plus reacts with two CO plus threes to produce Ti plus three and two CO plus twos. All right, so here are your reactants. So everything on the left side of the arrow, that's reactants. Everything on the right is products. All right, so um, Ti plus two, it does not show up. So the only thing that we have not labeled is the Ti plus two. Since we had formed the Ti plus 2 in the first reaction, we did not add it. It was formed and then used up. That is the definition of a reaction intermediate. All right. And so we labeled the reactants. We labeled the products. There are no catalysts. No catalysts. Now the reaction intermediate is your Ti plus 2 that we formed and it was used. And so that is your Ti plus 2 is your reaction intermediate. There's only one thing that didn't show up in the overall reaction and that was the Ti plus 2. And so that was not a catalyst because we didn't add it. It was a reaction intermediate. It was formed and then used. All right, so part C is to determine the rate law. So we use step two. Step two is the rate determining steps. So we're going to write the rate law from the rate determining step. Unfortunately, the rate determining step is step two, which makes this a much more difficult problem. And so you have rate is equal to K concentration of your Ti plus two concentration of your CO plus three. Remember that steps in a reaction mechanism are elementary reactions. And so we can use the coefficients as the exponents. 
only when they are steps in a reaction mechanism can you use the coefficients because the mechanism was determined experimentally. All right, so this is an invalid rate law for an overall reaction. So overall reactions cannot contain a reaction intermediate in the rate law. All right, so anytime you're gonna have this case where it's step two, note step one is fast and at equilibrium. And so anytime you have a reaction intermediate in your rate determining step, there will always be above it an equilibrium. So what you need to know equilibrium means is your rate of the forward reaction equals the rate of the reverse reaction. So if we look at step one, the rate of the forward reaction is equal to K, concentration of the reactants in step one, which are Ti plus and a, and a CO plus three. All right, so they're raised to the coefficients and those coefficients are both a one. Rate of the reverse, rate reverse. That's equal to a uh, note that um, for even up here, when we looked at just step two, it is then K2. When we look at K1, that's the forward K value. When we look at the reverse, that is K minus one. And now you have your products because the reverse reactions, you have products going to reactants. So when you're doing the rate law for the reverse, it is K minus one. And then the products of the first step, which are the TI plus two and the CO plus two. All right, and so since they are equal to each other, then we set them equal. So now we know that K1 concentration of Ti plus concentration of CO plus three is equal to K minus one concentration of Ti plus two concentration of CO plus two. All right, so every time we do this, once you use the definition of equilibrium correctly, you will always solve for the reaction intermediate. So you always solve for the reaction intermediate. So your reaction intermediate is the Ti plus two. And so we have to divide both sides by K minus one and CO plus two. We have to divide both sides by K minus one concentration CO plus two. And so that cancels that cancels. Now we have solved for Ti plus two, which is your labeled reaction intermediate. And so we're gonna do a substitution. So this is now K1 concentration of Ti plus, concentration of CO plus three, divided by K minus one concentration of CO plus two. All right, so now we had our um, rate law, rate determining step, which had a reaction intermediate in it. And so we are going to take this Ti plus two, and we're gonna do a substitution. So we're gonna substitute that into our rate determining steps rate law. All right, and so it's right here. If I can draw the arrow all the way up. All right, so here's the rate law. It is an invalid rate law. It was, we got it from the rate determining step, but it included the TI plus two. And so we're going to do a substitution. We now have TI plus two is equal to this. We simply substitute that in. All right, so we have our, from the rate determining step, Now we have the rate is equal to K2, 
concentration of your Ti plus 2, concentration of the CO plus 3. All right, so that's what we're plugging in right there. So you will always solve for the reaction intermediate, and then you will substitute that into your rate law from the rate determining step. And so rate is equal to K2. Now I'm putting in K1 over K minus one. I'm putting in the TI plus, I am putting in the CO plus three, and I am putting in the CO plus two. All right, so I'm gonna put that in brackets. All right, so that is what your uh, TI plus 2 was equal to. I just did the substitution. I plugged all of that in for TI plus 2. Now the CO plus 3 is still there. All right, so now we substituted that in. And so now we're going to say that your K2 times your K1 divided by the K minus 1 is simply equal to a, so a constant times a constant divided by a constant. That's simply uh, a constant. And then we're going to combine our CO plus 3 together. And so you have your final answer. Rate is equal to K, your concentration of TI plus, concentration of CO plus 3, divided by CO plus 2. Now, another way that you could do that is you put this up in the numerator, that is the correct answer, or you could write it as rate is equal to K, concentration of TI plus, concentration of CO plus three, oh, squared, sorry, CO plus three times three o, CO plus three squared, all right, then you can bring this up and it would be CO plus two to the negative one. So either way you write it is the correct overall rate law. All right, so now we give the orders for each substance in the rate law. The reason why you would put it up in this way because that is then the order. So your Ti plus is first order. Your CO plus three is second order. Your CO plus two is minus first order. And then when you add them up, one plus two minus one, you get the overall order. So it is a second order overall. All right, so again, you can have, so the TI plus and the CO plus three, those are reactants. CO plus two is a product and those are all fine. You can have products, reactants, and catalysts. You cannot have a reaction intermediate in your final answer for your rate law. All right, so give the overall order. We already did. You had the first order, second order, the minus first order. Overall, it is a second order reaction. Units for K, one over molarity times second. All right, so that is the end of that one. Nope, yep. So in F, it says label your reaction immediates. All right, so we did that in part B. We labeled our products. We labeled our reactants, we labeled that we had no catalyst, and we labeled our reaction intermediate. All right, a much easier question is number six. So in number six, we are at equilibrium for this reaction. Everything's a gas. All right, so there's very important to note everything is a gas. There's no liquids, no solids to ignore. Everything is a gas, and the delta H is minus 52 kilojoules. All right, so you need to know that that means it is exothermic, and heat is a product, all right? So you need to know that negative delta H is exothermic and that means that your heat is released, heat is a product. All right, so we are at equilibrium. We're gonna make the following changes and see which way the equilibrium will shift. It'll either shift left, right, or will not shift at all. So we have the perfect amount of NO here. Now in part A, we're going to remove the NO. When you remove 
anytime you remove a product that is part of the equilibrium, it's a gas, it will have to shift to the right to move to make more. And so it will have to shift right. H2O is added. All right, so this time H2O is a gas. So it's very important to note that H2O could be a solid, liquid, or gas depends on the temperature. All right, they're going to be labeled for you when it is uh, very important. All right, so when you do your rate law like we did before, it's not important if it's a solid, liquid. When we're doing our equilibrium constants, it is extremely important to label solids, liquids, and gases. All right, so it is H2O gas that is added to this. So when you had the perfect amount of H2O gas and you added more, now you have too much. It has to go to the left to get rid of it. All right, so anytime you are going to remove a product, it will always go to the right. Anytime you're going to add a product, it will always go left, assuming that those products are not solids or liquids. All right, and then a catalyst added that will have uh, no change. All right, you're at equilibrium, you're still at equilibrium. Nothing is going to change when you add a catalyst when you are at equilibrium. All right, what about when you remove oxygen? Well, oxygen is a reactant and it is a gas. All right, so when you remove a reactant, you have the perfect amount of the reactant. Now you don't have enough because you removed it. It has to go left to make more of that reactant. All right, so anytime you remove a reactant, it is going to shift it to the left. All right, so when you increase, our, our pressure is going to be decreased. So when you decrease the pressure, all right, so that is going to always be a volume increase. And so when you have a large volume, it's going to go to the side with the more moles of gases. So this is going to go to more moles of gases. All right, so in this reaction, everything was a gas. All right, so we had, when we add up our gases on the left and right, uh, we see on the left, uh, we have four and five, we have nine gases, nine moles of gas. On the left, we have four and six, we have 10 moles of gas on the right. All right, so when you have a larger volume, it is going to go to the right uh, because there are more moles of gas. Okay, so when we come here, this, all right, so our reaction is 9 moles of gas going to 10 moles of gas. All right, and so it's going to, when you have a larger volume, it's going to go to the side with the more moles of gas, and so this one goes to the right. 10 moles of gas. All right, so you have the same answer down here. It's just a different type. So this is going to talk about volume. Volume is decreased. When you decrease the volume, you're pushing down hard to decrease that volume. That's an increase in pressure. Those are the same. All right, and so when you have a uh, volume that is very small, you're going to go to the side with the fewer amount of moles of gas. And so this one is going to go to the 9 moles of gas, not the 10 moles of gas. It is going to shift to the left. If you would have the same number of moles of gas on both sides, then it would not change. The equilibrium would not change. All right, so here uh, temperature is going to increase. What's that going to do to our equilibrium? All right, so this is an exothermic reaction as stated before, and heat is a product, right? So it's exothermic, minus 52, heat is a product, And so when you are increasing the temperature, you are increasing the heat, you are increasing a product. So when you increase the product, that means you have too much product it is going to shift to the left. All right, so that's how you will want to always think about your temperature increase or decrease. It depends on whether the reaction is endothermic or exothermic. For every exothermic reaction, if you increase the temperature, it's going to shift to the left. For every endothermic reaction, if you increase the temperature, it would shift to the right. All right. Number seven. So now we're going to do a bunch of uh, equilibrium questions. All right. So uh, 
Uh, calculate the equilibrium concentrations at 600 degrees Celsius. That's not that important unless we're going to then convert to Kp, which I think we are. Uh, then we will need the temperature. But again, your uh, equilibrium constants will change at different temperatures. All right, so we're starting with 1.25 molar, and we started with 0 and 0, and the Kc is very small. All right, and so we know that X is very small, and I will always use successive approximations when I have a small K value, which means I have a small X value. And so you have zeros. You cannot have zeros at equilibrium. So it has to go to form sum. Minus the coefficient 1x plus the coefficient 1x plus the coefficient 2x. So at equilibrium, I have 1.25 minus x. I have x and I have 2x. And when I write the expression for Kc, it is the concentration C4H6 and also, all of these are gases, all right? Very important when you're writing the expression that we are including all of them because they are all gases. And then our C4H10, all right? So when you write the K, that means you must put in the equilibrium uh, numbers and Kc is given. And so this is one times 10 to the minus six, that's equal to X, and 2x squared and 1.25 minus x. So when I say x is very small, what does that mean? Well, that means when I take my 1.25 and I subtract a very small number, I'm going to get approximately 1.25. All right, and so that is the, the whole concept of successive approximations. And so I am going to then neglect x. I know that my x is small because my k is small. And then I will solve for x and then I will have to check it. 1.00 times 10 to the minus 6. When I multiply this out, this is x, this is 4x squared. So this is 4x to the third in the numerator. And on bottom, I'm neglecting this x, it's one point. So I multiply both sides by 1.25, I divide by 4, and I take the third root on my calculator, and I get my first x value. So when I do this, my x1 value, uh, and note that my uh, k value is given to 3 sig figs, my concentration is given to 3 sig figs, and so I'm going to give my x value to 3 sig figs. 0 0.00679. Now, I'm going to check to see uh, if that gives me the same answer twice. So to do that, you plug it in here. So you plug in your x value where you neglected it. 1.00 times 10 to the minus 6 is equal to x is equal to 2x squared over 1.25 now minus your 0 0.00679. All right, so you do the subtraction, multiply by the 1 times 10 to the minus 6. Again, divide by 4 and take the cubed root. And so the second x value that you get, uh, the first x value is always the largest. The second x value is always the smallest. In this case, it is 0 0.00677. All right, if we only had two sig figs in this question, then we would be done. But this one has three sig figs, and so we're going to get it to be the same number to three sig figs. And so now we plug this one in. So instead of this number here, we're going to plug this number in. 1.00 times 10 to the minus 6 is equal to x, 2x squared over 1.25 minus 0.00677. So we do the subtraction, multiply by 1 times 10 to the minus 6, divide by 4, because remember, right up here too, remember the numerator is 4x to the third. So the numerator is 4x to the third 
four. Let me write up there. For some reason. All right. So anyway, it's four x to the third. Not sure why it's not letting me write up here. Okay. Four x to the third. All right, so we do the subtraction in our parentheses, multiply by the 1 times 10 to the minus 6, divide by 4, take the third root, and we get x3 exactly the same as x2, 0 0.00677. So when you get the same answer twice, then you are finished with calculating of x. So now we got to plug in our equilibrium concentrations. And so... Uh, for our equilibrium concentrations, we know that our concentration of C4H10 is equal to 1.25 minus 0 0.00677. And when you do that, and you have two decimals minus five decimals, and you give your answer to two decimals, that is 1.24 molar. Your... C4H6 concentration is simply X, so that is 0 0.00677 molar. And then your H2 concentration is 2X, uh, which is, now here's where I would take two answers. If you don't clear your calculator out, uh, you will get a 0, 0.0. 135 molar. If you do clear your calculator and you plug that number back in, uh, because there's a three after that seven, um, which actually is a three seven, which would round to four, uh, you would get 0 0.0134 molar. Right? So either one of those answers would be uh, full credit. All right, so if you're rounding your answers and then getting numbers, I will accept that. You're not supposed to round until the very end. Again, uh, so either way is completely uh, full credit. All right, so then in part B, we're going to calculate Kp. So the equation is Kp is equal to Kc RT to the delta N. All right, so to find delta N, delta N, moles product, moles of gas product minus moles gas reactant. So you can't just say products minus reactants because it's only the gases. In this reaction, everything was a gas. And so we had three moles. Uh, we had one of the C4H6, two of the H2, minus one mole of the uh, reactant C4H10. And so the delta N for this reaction is 2. All right. Um, our temperature was 600 degrees Celsius. Always convert that to Kelvin. So add 273.15, but we don't need the 0.15 since it's only given as no decimals. We're going to give it to no decimals. 873 Kelvin is our temperature. All right, units, extremely important units. So you need to know that Kp, you're going to use atmospheres. All right, always pressure in atmospheres. Kc is always molarity, moles per liter. All right, so your R value has to have atmospheres in it. All right, there is only one. So here you have 0 0.08206 liter atmosphere per mole Kelvin. You must know your units to know what R value to use. So then you just plug in your numbers. All right, so the KC was given 1 times 10 to the minus 6. Then you have your 0 0.08206 for your R value. You have your 873 for your Kelvin. And then you have 2 for your delta N. And so when you calculate your Kp, you get 0 0.00513. All right, so you'll have to be able to convert from Kp to Kc or from Kc to Kp. Either way, this one was Kc to Kp.
there'll be one unknown. All right, so here is where we have concentrations of all three, and we will need to find out if the reaction will go left or right. So here you have to have your KC and compare it to your QC. Remember, they have the exact same expression. KC is a constant, and so for this reaction, it was given. 1 times 10 to the minus 6. All right, and so we have to compare that to the QC, which is a non-equilibrium. So we started with these um, concentrations. So remember, it is the same expression, C4H6. H2 squared over C4 H10. All right, it's exactly the same expression, except it's not at equilibrium. So we plug in the numbers and get our Q. All right, so we have uh, C4 H6, 0 0.0020. Same for H2, 0 0.0020, but we square it. C4H10 is 0.75, and that's going to give us our Q. C, and when you push the buttons on your calculator, uh, you get QC to be 1.1 times 10 to the minus 8. And so we are comparing that to our KC, 1.1 times 10 to the minus 8. All right, and so we see that that is much smaller. Minus 8 is much smaller than 1 times 10 to the minus 6. So our Q is not big enough. Remember, it's always up here, concentration products over concentration reactants. All right, and so when it is smaller than your KC, that means it has to get bigger. The only way it can get bigger is to go to the right. And remember, if you forget that, if you put the KC first and then the QC second, the arrow will always point you in the right direction. However, if you put the QC first and the KC second, it will point you in the wrong direction. Right. So your Q is too small. It needs to get bigger. The only way it can get bigger is to get more products. Go to the right. We're going to do the exact same thing here. We still have our 1 times 10 to the minus 6 for the KC. And now we got to find QC again. This time it's 0 0.015, 0 0.015 squared. And then our C4H10 is 0 0.25. And so you calculate your QC. This time, when you push the buttons on your calculator, you get 1.35 times 10 to the minus 5. All right, it should be two sig figs, but we're not calculating QC was not the question. In order to get the answer, you must calculate it and show that work. What you need to show here is that 1.35 times 10 to the minus 5 is larger. That means it is larger than K, and so it is too big. The only way you can make it small is to get less products, and it's going to go to the left. And again, if you uh, put in your... Uh, number, you see that uh, your 1 times 10 to the minus 6 is less than the 1.35 times 10 to the minus 5. Again, it's going to point you to the left if you write your KC first and your QC second. All right, so that one, the reaction will proceed to the left until it reaches equilibrium. All right, now in part E, it says, what if we start with 25 atmospheres of C4H10, 15 atmospheres of C4H6, and zero atmospheres of hydrogen gas? All right, and the Kp we determined uh, earlier from our equation of Kp is equal to KCRT to the delta N, 0 0.00513. All right, so we don't have to calculate Q. If we have a zero, we know which way it's going to go. It's going to form some. You can never have zero at equilibrium. So we have minus 1 coefficient of 1x plus the coefficient of 1x and plus the coefficient of 2x. So at equilibrium, we have 25.0 minus x, 15.0 plus x, and 2x. This is a small number, so we know x is small. All right. 
So what does that mean? That means when we take our 25.0 and we subtract a small number, we're going to get about 25.0. That also means when we take 15.0 and we add a small number, we're still going to get 15.0. And so that is the, again, the whole concept of successive approximations. So we have to get our equilibrium concentrations. Uh, so we got to find X. And so our expression for KP, it is the pressure of your C4H6. It is the pressure of H2 squared divided by the pressure of C4H10. All right, and we have that number. That is 0 0.00. 513. All right, so then we plug in our, all right, so we plug in our 15 plus x, we plug in our 2x and we square it. We plug in our 25 minus x, and then we know that x is small, so we neglect. When we add or subtract a small number, we say it will not change it. And so we end up with 0 0.00513 is equal to 15. And then our 2x squared is then a 4x squared. Don't forget to square the 2. Divided by 25. We neglected our x. All right, so when we multiply both sides by 25, divide both sides by 15, divide both sides by 4, then to get x, we have to take the square root. When you do that, you get x1 to be 0 0.0462. All right, so now we neglected it in two spots, so we got to plug it back in in two spots. So we got to plug it in here, and we've got to plug it in here. And so we have 0 0.00513, and we're going to do this until we get the same answer twice. 15.0 plus 0 0.0462, and then you have your 2x squared, which is going to be 4x squared. When we square that. And then on the numer and denominator, 25.0 minus 0 0.0462. All right, so you subtract that, multiply both sides by that number, add that, divide both sides by that number, divide by 4, take the square root. So when you get your x2 from pushing the buttons here, you get 0 0.0462. One, All right, and so since this was given to three sig figs, all the numbers and uh, the k, we're going to go until we have the same answer exactly to three sig figs. This is the highest number. This is the lowest number. Uh, we got to do it one more time to get the exact same number. So again, you plug it in where it was neglected, 0 0.00513. You have your 15.0 plus. 0 0.0461, 2x squared, 25.0 minus 0 0.0461. All right, 25 minus 0 0.0461, multiply both sides by that, 15 plus 0 0.0461, divide both sides by that, divide by 4, take the square root, and you get 0 0.0461. You get the exact same answer uh, twice. That is your final answer. And so to get the uh, pressures, all right, so you have uh, your pressure for your C4H6. That was your 15.0 plus. 0 0.0461, and when you have one decimal and one decimal, that comes out to be 15.0 atm. All right, and so that uh, adding of x, 
very close. It was almost 0.05 uh, to go up to 15.1, but not enough. All right, so it stays at 15.0. Uh, your pressure of H2, that is simply 2 times X. And so you take this times 2, uh, and you get 0 0.0922 atm. Remember, when you're doing Kp, units or atmospheres. And then your pressure of C4H10 is 25.0 minus 0 0.0461. And again, it's 04. It's not going to change it to 24.9. It rounds back up to 25.0 atmospheres. So this one was very close to changing it, but it did not. So our equilibrium and initial pressures are the same for the C4H6 and the C4H10, and that is because the Kp is small. It was almost large enough to change it, but not quite. All right, same question on number eight. We have our initial uh, pressures, and we're given a Kp. And the Kp is a small number. All right, so we know which direction it's going to go. You have a zero. You cannot have a zero. And so it has to go to the right and form some. So your change minus the coefficient of 1x plus the coefficient of 1x plus the coefficient of 1x at equilibrium 1.5 minus x x and 1.0 plus x. This is very small. And so x will be very small. So when you take what that means is 1.5 minus x is going to be 1.5. You take 1.5, subtract the small number, sig figs are going to give you 1.5. 1.0 plus a very small number is still going to give you 1.0. All right, so let's plug that in. So we have 3.0 times 10 to the minus 7. That is equal to your uh, pressure of PCl3, pressure Cl2 over pressure PCl5. All right, so we plug in our numbers. That is x, that is 1.0 plus x, and that is 1.5 minus x. And again, we are going to neglect the plus and minus x because as stated over here, x is a small number. And so x1. When you take your 3.0 times 10 to the minus 7, multiply by 1.5, divide by 1 to get your x value. You get 4.5 times 10 to the minus 7. All right. When you plug that in, you will see that it is not going to change it at all. x2 4.5 times 10 to the minus 7. So uh, there, I don't bother to plug it in when it's that small. I know for sure when it's that small, it is not going to change. But if you are not sure, plug it in. You will get the exact same answer two times. All right. And so your pressure of PCl5 is not going to change. It is 1.5 plus 4.5 times 10 to the minus 7, which doesn't change it at all, 1.5 atm. Oh, PCL5, that was minus, okay, it doesn't matter, it's not going to change it. Your pressure of Cl2, well, that was x, that's why we did the problem. Uh, and so that is not 0, it is very small at 4.5 times 10 to the minus 7 atm. And then your PCL3, that was uh, your, oh, sorry, I got those, this is PCL3, that was X, your 
pressure of Cl2, that's the one that we started with 1.0, and then we added 4.5 times 10 to the minus 7. That does not change at all, and so that is 1.0 OT. All right, so your pressure of PCl5, 1.5 atmospheres, your pressure of your PCl3, which was X, 4.5 times 10 to the minus 7 atmospheres, and your pressure of Cl2, which started at 1 atmosphere and went up by nothing, essentially, is still 1 atmosphere. All right, so those are your equilibrium pressures, all right? All right, so here, uh, both of our products are zero, so you got to go to the right, minus x plus x plus x and so you got your point one zero minus x x and x all right so again we have an extremely small kc that's very small when you are minus five or smaller that's very small x is going to be very small you do not need to check your x when it is a very small number all right, so what does that mean? That means that when we take 0 0.10 and subtract a very small number, we're going to get 0 0.10. All right, so we put in our setup. 1 times 10 to the minus 8. That's equal to x times x divided by 0 0.10 minus x. We neglect our number here, and we get... Our value for x1, and that is 3.2 times 10 to the minus 5. All right, so we multiplied both sides by 0.1 and we took the square root. All right, you can plug that in. That is nowhere going to change at all, the 0 0.10, but if in doubt, plug it in and you'll get the same answer twice. And especially since this is only two sig figs. So you can stop after the first one, and you see that minus 5 is nowhere near going to change at 0 0.10. And so then your answers, all right, so your PCL5, uh, your PCL5 is your 0 0.10 plus 3.2 times 10 to the minus 5. Doesn't change it at all. 0 0.10 molar, uh, your Cl2 concentration, which is equal to your PCl3 concentration, which is equal to X, which is equal to 3.2 times 10 to the minus 5 molar. So both of these are X. They are the same. All right. Up. All right, so number 10, is that another equilibrium? All right, good. No, it's not. All right, so we have a different problem to do. All right, another one that uh, will for sure be on the test. And uh, is one where we did in our first lab, where we determined our rate law from the initial rate method. All right, so we have our reaction. All right, so we have three reactants. When you have three reactants, you have to do four experiments. One in lab, we had two reactants, and we did three experiments. So you have to do one more experiment, then you have reactant to determine the rate law. All right, so when we get, look at experiment one and compare it to experiment two, note that our H2O2 concentration changed, but the others remained the same. All right, so then when we go down to three, we see that from one to three, only the I minus change. And then from one to four, only the H plus change. All right, and so we are going to determine our rate law by taking uh, your uh, rate experiment two, rate experiment one, and that is equal to K, experiment 2, K, experiment 1, 
concentration of H2O2 raised to some power x, the concentration of H2O2 raised to some power x, I minus raised to some power y, I minus raised to some power y, and then finally your H plus raised to some power Z, H plus raised to some power Z, all right? So I have the sub twos, the sub ones, because it's in one and two. All right, so if we look at rate two, it was 3.3 .3 times 10 to the minus six. When we look at rate one, it was 1.1 times 10 to the minus six. All right, for the first experiment that we did to determine the rate law, we did not change the temperature. Ks will always be constant unless you change the temperature. We also looked at the concentrations. I minus didn't change, H plus didn't change. From two to one, the only one that changed was the H2O2. In uh, experiment two, it was 0.03. To the x and then experiment one it was 0.01 to the x all right so this reduces down into 3.3 divided by 1.13 0 .03, 0.03 divided by 0 0.01 is 3 to the x and so you see here that x is equal to 1 so we know that the reaction is first order with h2o2 all right so then we're going to do <coughs> rate 3 over rate 1 Right, and so the K3, the K1, we didn't change the temperature. They are the same. H2O2 concentrations, we know is raised to the first. H2O2 concentrations, we know is raised, doesn't matter. They didn't change. They will cancel. The I minus concentrations, they did change from three to one. Your H plus concentration in three, your H plus concentration and one, they were exactly the same. All right, and so we plug in the ones that change. Rate three, 4.4 .4 times 10 to the minus six. Rate one, 1 1.1 times 10 to the minus six. The I minus concentration in run three was 0.02 raised to the y. For experiment one, it was 0.01 raised to the y. All right, so when you divide this, you get four. When you divide this, you get two to the y. All right, if you don't immediately see that, you can take the log, take the ln or the natural log. Remember the rules. So you have the ln of four, uh, then you bring the y out in front, ln of 2, divide both sides by the ln of 2, and y is equal to 2. So it is second order with respect to i minus. All right, so then we're going to take uh, rate four divided by rate one, and that is equal to K4 over K1. They are the same, they cancel. H2O2 concentrations are the same, they cancel. The I minus concentrations are the same, they cancel. All right, the H plus does not cancel, it is not the same. All right, so from run four to the Z to the H plus concentration of run one to the Z. All right, so rate four, we look at rate four, 1.1 times 10 to the minus six. 1.1 times 10 to the minus six, they are both the same rate. One and four have the same rate. H plus in run four is 0 0.0020 raised to the Z. 
uh, in run one, it is 0 0.0010 raised to the z. And so you get one is equal to two to the z. You can do the logs. So if you do the ln or the log log, it doesn't matter. ln of one or log of one is zero. All right, and so if you take the ln of one <clears throat> divided by the ln of two, that's going to give you z. That's going to give you zero. All right, so anything raised to zero is one. So it is zero order with respect to h plus. And so now we can give the rate law. So rate is equal to k concentration of H2O2 raised to the x, we calculated as 1. I minus, we calculated, is 2. H plus is 0. You don't put it in if it's 0, because anything raised to the 0 is 1. All right, so in part B, give the orders of the substances in the rate law and the overall. So it is first order with respect to H2O2, it is second order with respect to I minus, <clears throat> and it is third order overall. All right. So calculate the rate constant K. So we gotta plug in the numbers. So rate is equal to K, concentration, H2O2 raised to the first, I minus, squared. You just pick one of the runs, I'll pick run one. Rate one, 1. 1.1 times 10 to the minus six. K is what we're calculating. Uh, and this is rate is molarity per second. H2O2, 0.01. I minus is also 0.01. And when you push the buttons on your calculator, you get 1.1, and that's your answer, but you need the correct units. So this is molarity per second, this is molarity, this is molarity squared. When we bring those down, we get one over molarity squared times seconds, which we know are the units for a third order overall rate law. All right, now a simple one. Write the expression for Kc. So Kc is equal to the concentration of CO squared divided by CO2. The only reason why this is a question is make sure you don't put in the solid. Same for this one right here, Kc is the concentration of CH4, concentration of water, no, that is a liquid. I'll make it a lot clearer that that is an L, it's gonna be typed out on the test. Do not put in a liquid. CO concentration and H2 concentration to the third. For your KCs, you only put Gases and aqueous, solids and liquids, you do not put into your Kc. Kp, you only put pressures, in, so you only put your gases. All right, and here is a question that I just added. All right, so you're going to be given two reactions, right? So there are the two reactions given. You're given this one with a Kc value. You're given this one with a Kc value. Determine the equilibrium constant for this third one. So you got to manipulate these two reactions to add up to give this reaction. So we have to have our C2H3O2 minus on the left. The only place that we have that is on the right. So we have to reverse the first reaction. So we have H3O plus and C2H3O2 minus in equilibrium with HC2H3O2 plus H2O. And now the KC for that, when you reverse the reaction, you gotta take 
1 over that Kc, which is 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5. So that is important. If we were to double it, which we are not going to do, but if we were, you would have to square the Kc value. And then the second reaction, we leave it alone. And so that's 2H2O in equilibrium with H3O plus and OH minus. <clears throat> and the Kc, we left it alone. That is 1.0 times 10 to the negative 14. All right, and so when we add that up, because we needed OH on the right, that's why we didn't change that. The H3O plus will cancel. One of the waters is gone. And then you have the reaction that is given in the question, which is your C2H3O2 minus plus your H2O in equilibrium with your OH minus and your h C2, H3, O2. When you add these two reactions, you have to multiply the two K values. All right, so we have to multiply the two numbers. So when you take one over this, uh, that number is 5.6 times 10 to the fourth. And so the KC here is your 5.6 times 10 to the 4th times 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. All right, so when you add reactions, you multiply the K values. Your final answer, 5.6 times 10 to the minus 10. And there are your 12 problems for exam one review.